We are going to be talking about forgiveness today. Forgiveness. So if there's someone here you cannot forgive, you came to the right lesson. All right. Let, let's all start reconciling with each other. All right. Exodus 34 and Psalm 32. What we're going to be covering in this topic, however, is more so related to soteriology. In other words, the doctrine of salvation. So we're going to be covering some things that we can practically do in our Christian living to forgive others. However, we're going to concentrate more so on the basis of our salvation, how forgiveness works. We should not take it very lightly. It is an important aspect in order for us to be saved. Now, I hope, like I mentioned many times in our beginner's discipleship lessons, that people do not take this as something that I already know. Well, no, you don't know, one. And number two, even if you do know, you need to be reminded and you need to be refreshed to appreciate. You need to contemplate more on the basics. I strongly believe that. What made me stronger in my confidence and in debating complex topics is to study the basics. So epistemology and philosophers, they make a very big deal when they talk about complex subjects, about basics. So even intellectuals strive on basics. So I want you all to understand that. So I'm not saying that you're all going to grow up to be philosophers, but I, my point is it's not that dumb like you think when we do basic doctrines. It's a very uh, high-level, respectable thing even for intellectuals. So when we go through these basics, you have to ponder them a little bit more. When we go through the verses, see something in there that I'm trying to explain to you that you might find another insight behind it, okay? So that's critical thinking in Bible studies. So don't just listen to the preacher and then go, oh, I already know. No, use your critical thinking. Look at my explanation. Look at the verse. Analyze it and see if you can find something more to what I'm saying. Okay? Then it'll be incredibly eye-opening. And I want us to treat the subject of forgiveness that way as well as any other Bible study we do on salvation. Because that's probably the most important doctrine to you. The most important doctrine to you is your salvation, <coughs> which is why you want to know about this, because it relates to you. All right, let's start off with Psalm 32 and then Exodus 34. Verse 1 of the book of Psalm, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is what? Now notice right here, it's covered. So forgiveness does not necessarily have to mean a complete eradication, okay? It can also mean that it's covered. In other words, the sin is still there. However, it can be covered. When we go to Exodus 34, verse 7, Exodus 34, verse 7, notice that in the Old Testament, this was practice. Whenever God forgave the children of Israel, it was not clearing their sins. And the easy answer why is because you need Jesus Christ to die on the cross. We know that. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his precious blood, that cleared away the sins. The Old Testament Jews never had that for uh, thousands of years. So the Old Testament saints never had that. Hence, when the Lord forgave them, he had to just forgive them but simply as a covering, not an actual clearing. If you were to think about your forgiveness to other people, that might be helpful. Sometimes it's hard to clear it from your mind and from your heart, but at least you can cover it, right? You can try to cover it as best as you can. All right, so that was just a bonus over there. Use your head now, okay? <laughs> Exodus 34, verse 7. Keeping mercy for thousands... Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that by no means, what? Clear the guilty. Did you see that? So notice that he can forgive iniquity and transgression. But the guilty, which we know that the Old Testament saints, they're still dead in their trespasses and sins. They're still guilty. They're not cleared. 
So they can receive forgiveness, but not a clearance. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. <coughs> when we say, as New Testament Christians, our sins are forgiven, it's more than just simply a covering. We get our sins cleared. So forgiveness, when God forgives you, that means that your sins are cleared. Hence, we've seen a double meaning here with forgiveness. Forgiveness means not just a clearance, it also means covering. It also, it's not just covering, but it also means clearance. We have to understand it has a double meaning in forgiveness. Now, when we look at Webster's 1828 Dictionary, this is usually the common knowledge of people regarding forgiveness. They're going to see a pardon of an offender not treating the person as guilty. And then, uh, oh, the King's Bible, King James Bible. Wow, they, the modern advertisers realize how important that book is. Well, anyway, and Texas Receptus Bibles. Wow, this guy's King James only. All right. <laughs> We're going to send a large donations to Webster's 1828. Bible Gateway, don't you dare send them a donation, okay? <laughs> All right, anyway, going back, going back to our point. So, uh, man, King James Bible Dictionary. This guy's KJV only. All right. It's so distracting. Let me get rid of that. It is so distracting. Yeah. All right. Man, this is a KJV only site. I'm very persuaded. So we see right here, it's a pardon of an offense or crime. You notice, like I mentioned before, it's pardoning of an offense. You don't treat them as guilty. There's a willingness there to forgive. It's a remission. Now, we see right here the definitions of forgiveness. Remission, for some of you who don't know, to be quite honest, the title of today's topic should be remission, not forgiveness. But I'm saying forgiveness, that way we can <coughs> understand in layman's term. What is remission? You saw right here, it means forgiveness. So, if you are asked next time, what is one of the doctrines of salvation? What did God did do with you when you get saved? What is one of the shuns in salvation? This is one of them you're going to hear, remission. Just like justification, just like redemption, just like sanctification, shun, 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 etc. So these shuns are famously known within salvation doctrines. Remission is one of them. And that means forgiveness. But... There is hardly any definition here that specifically tells you if this is really a covering or a clearance. You notice that? So this is the common knowledge of people is Webster's 1828 ideology. But when you look at the Bible itself, it shows what these four definitions actually mean. It can be covered or it can be cleared. A lot of people don't understand that. So when you look at any definition of forgiveness nowadays, it will fall on these two categories, which will be very helpful. Now I want you to turn to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. Oh, what just happened? Okay. <clears throat> we looked at the definition of forgiveness. Now we're going to look at the problem behind forgiveness. Oh, problem behind forgiveness. Forgiveness don't just come out like that. There has to be a problem, right? Forgiveness means, hey, there's a problem here. That's why I need to do forgiveness. We have to understand the problem behind it so we can better appreciate this aspect. Do you know how many people just want forgiveness, but they don't contemplate on their problem? And that's why everyone has a victimization mentality now, taking advantage of people, and they have no shame about that. We cannot have that kind of mentality. That's an ungrateful mentality. If we are victimized by something, we know the problem. We experience the problem. That makes us more appreciative of the solution that saves us from our victimized state. Did that make any sense to you? All right, so that's the kind of day and age we live in, okay? I don't know sometimes what's worse, being the abuser or playing the abused. 
But that's something to think about, okay? All right, Isaiah 59, verse 2. <coughs> but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that notice he will not hear. Sin separates you from God up in heaven, which is a no-brainer. That's the reason why you and I, we need forgiveness. If we don't have that important aspect, then we're doomed. We'll never go to heaven. Because we know that God is holy, that means no sin. See that? If this means no sin for heaven, then how can a sinner go to heaven? See, so people, they think that they can live their whole lives as long as I'm a good person, I can go to heaven. No, you still have sin. It don't change that fact. You need forgiveness. Do you know how many people think they can go to heaven without forgiveness? You think this is a no-brainer subject, but you'd be surprised how many people are no-brainers nowadays. They think they can go to heaven without forgiveness. Well, why should God let you into heaven? Because I'm a good person, because I've done these good things, because God is cruel. Why would he send me to hell forever? See, they refuse to recognize the problem. So we have to recognize the problem. I keep emphasizing that. People refuse to see they have a problem because they think they don't have a problem. They think it's understandable. Everybody has it. And this is a normal thing. And then God, he's just being too legalistic. He's just being too strict. When we go to Acts 26, Acts chapter 26, the key to going to heaven, I know people will say it's about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's through Jesus Christ, it's through salvation, but you can't just throw out those terms that easily. There's a deeper meaning behind those things. The reason why Jesus is the only way to heaven, the blood is important for your access to the throne. And salvation is the key to get you to heaven, but the key behind that key of salvation and all those other elements is forgiveness. When you have forgiveness, when you have remission, then God can't judge you for your sin. God can't say, you have sin, so I can't allow you into heaven. Forgiveness is crucial. If you look at verse 18, <coughs> to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Notice an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, that is in me. So notice that you could go in God. Notice that you can go to the heavenly inheritance up there because of, notice, forgiveness. They may receive forgiveness. When you have that, then you can notice right here, inheritance among them, sanctified faith, me. Now, I don't think a lot of people realize that. So go to Psalm 86, Psalm chapter 86. If you notice Acts chapter 26 that we looked at, notice that you have sanctification, you get the inheritance, and all the other things operating. All right. Why is that important? Because think about this. You don't get sanctified before you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. It happens after you do that. Or if you want to say in the middle of it, fine. But the point is you have to call upon him. When you call upon him, then you get the operations of sanctification you get the operation of adoption. You get the operation of justification. And those doctrines are extremely important for your salvation. You know that, right? But if God did not, listen, if God did not have forgiveness ready to begin with, you can't even call upon him, pray to him, for salvation and get justification, sanctification, adoption, and all those things. What do I mean by that? Remember <coughs> Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2 we looked at? Sin, see that here? Sin is separates between you and God. So if a person were to talk to God, he is not here. 
That's another word for pray. That's another word for calling upon. People think that calling upon is just believing. Well, no, you don't read your Bible. It means to talk. That's why we can tell him our belief in Christ for salvation. It also means to pray in the Old Testament. I don't think they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But the point is, when we call upon God, it's ignored because of your sin problem. The only way he's going to allow that is he has forgiveness ready at hand. When he has that, I am ready to forgive to anyone who would ask for forgiveness, who would call upon me for salvation so that my forgiveness can be applied. <clears throat> he has to have that ready all the time. So think about this. This is quite a blessing. I don't care how wretched of a sinner you are and you are a uh, extreme liberal atheist who hates God, he still has forgiveness ready at hand, whereas you and I don't. You know why you have trouble forgiving others? You don't have it ready at hand. That's why we have to understand that if we understand this doctrine more, it'll help us when we apply it for our everyday life. God, he always has forgiveness ready at hand. So we have to ask ourselves, do we do the same thing as well? When we go to Psalm 86, verse 5, For thou, Lord, art good, and what? <clears throat> Not just forgiving, but ready to forgive. He's always prepared to do so. And plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. See, if they call upon him, he's ready at hand. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplication. So God can hear that prayer. Man, so then if you say, God, will you save my soul from hell? He's not going to say no because of your sin. He has forgiveness ready. So when he has that ready, when you call upon him, Lord, will you save my soul from hell? That thing has always been ready, forgiveness all that time. And all he has to do is apply that when you call upon him for salvation. <clears throat> Forgiveness becomes the most impro important problem to sinners. And I actually want to tell you four psychological problems. So these are real psychological, mental struggles and issues that even lost people, uh, they'll have to admit that this can happen at times. There are four psychological problems with men's mentality outside of anything physical or pathological. So let's get out of the science part and then try to focus on these aspects that are more spiritual that even, like I said, secular psychologists or scientists will admit that does sometimes happen. Four things. One, person has a guilt complex and has not been forgiven by God has a guilt complex, has not been forgiven by God. The second one is the person thinks God has not forgiven him when God has forgiven him. The second thing is God th uh, the person thinks God has not forgiven him, thinks he's unforgiven. All right, don't be offended, ladies. I'm just doing he's because it's just easier, okay? <laughs> I don't want to do he and then she. It's just uh, too much writing space. All right, uh, right here, C, he has refused to forgive somebody else. He has refused to forgive somebody else. Refuse to forgive. Now think about any psychological problem that can happen when you have one of these areas operating. It not only affects you, it affects other people. So it's a, it's a real psychological problem actual case. D, somebody has refused to forgive him and it bothers him. Somebody refused to forgive him and it bothers him. Did you have somebody who says, no, I can't forgive you? And to this day, it's a psychological mental struggle in your case. Perhaps you are a parent and then 
that child point out something that you did wrong and you feel so bad and it's eating you up and then you're trying to make things right and they don't forgive you. That really hurts parents nowadays. It's become a psychological problem to them. Now, in these four areas, these are actual real life cases. So, we realize how important forgiveness is then. It saves us a lot of problems. It saves us from psychological issues, and also it saved our souls from hell. That's why this doctrine is important. like, oh, I, I already know. No, you got to realize how important it is. And the only way, like I told you before, you're going to recognize the importance is if you understand the problem better. We're going to uh, look at Mark chapter 2, please. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, and then verse 7, verse 7 will be demonstrated. The author of forgiveness, that's the next point, the author of forgiveness. And obviously, that's God, we know that. He's the only one that qualifies to forgive you of your sins. If you want forgiveness to actually operate, more so than seeking forgiveness from a fellow human being, and if you're an unbeliever, if you think that a fellow human being forgives you, that you're going to gain peace, no, you're not. Because how many sins have you committed in your life that actually were not committed at somebody else? In your heart, in your thoughts. Don't you want that release from it? So... You need God. And when you have God that, oh, all these things that I've done was a sin against him, then you receive forgiveness. Do you now understand why liberals and atheists, they make morals very relative? That's very important to them. Because they have so much stuff that they committed inwardly that have not been solved. So they want to treat those things as relative. It's just a normal thing. But hey, I know this. It's eating you up. Now go to Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Only God has the power to forgive sins, not men. So just being a liberal, a secular liberal, receiving forgiveness from people is not the answer. Notice right here, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but what? God only. Now why is that important to understand God alone and not men? It's a dull statement you might think, but it's a little bit more deep than you think. Okay, think about it. If you uh, stole uh, cash from me, and then I found out later on, I can forgive you, okay? Because that is something that you committed against me. However, if you go past the speed limit, or if you commit a crime, you break the law here, I can't forgive you. You might say, why? Because it doesn't matter how much I forgive you, the law demands you to be imprisoned, or to pay a fine, or to suffer the consequences of the law. See, I could say, I forgive you, I forgive you, but that don't mean you're forgiven because you broke the law of this country. Now think about this. I can forgive you probably for any sin that you've done in your life, but that doesn't mean you're forgiven because the sins you've committed are against the law of God. So when you break his law, I don't care if some mumbo-jumbo guy does this to you. Or even me as a saved Christian say, I forgive you. No. And, you know, all of heaven itself can tell God, I forgive you, I forgive you, so will you let that person out of hell? No, that person is still going to burn in hell. You can say to the lost loved one and family member that you want to see go to heaven, say, I forgive you, I forgive you, but it doesn't matter. By the way, I think that the people that wronged you in your life, if they are lost and they did end up in hell, I have a feeling that in your heart, you're going to forgive them. Why? Because nobody wants to see someone fry for eternity. You think that's enough. But guess what? God won't forgive. Why? Because they didn't come to him for forgiveness. That's why this is very serious. It's not just a dove thing, only God forgives. No, you have to realize this, is that did you really go through the author of forgiveness? A lot of people never did that, right? They think they can just be forgiven just like that because 
they've done something or somebody else forgive, forgave them, but that's not the point. You broke his law, and that's the key to forgiveness. He's the only author for it. We go to Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Acts 5, 31. <clears throat> because we know God is the only being that can forgive you truly, <clears throat> Jesus Christ qualifies as well. He's not just a man. So if you're a Muslim or a Jehovah Witness, you do not believe Jesus is God, then that's the reason why we do have the right to doubt your salvation. If you don't believe in the deity of Christ, and you claim that you believed by faith, not by works for your salvation, we do have the right to question it. So I'm not going to say 100% you're not saved, but I do have the right to question it because you cannot receive forgiveness, salvation, until you go through that only author. And if you don't recognize Jesus as God, then you've just uh, blocked yourself from the author of forgiveness. So Acts chapter 5, verse 31. <clears throat> Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and what? Forgiveness of sins. Savior, that's referring to Jesus Christ. But don't forget the book of Mark. Who can forgive sins but God only? So you have no choice but to recognize Jesus as God. Otherwise, you're not going to receive the forgiveness. Now go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. The reason why Jesus Christ is so important for your forgiveness, it's not only because he is the author. So let me repeat that again. Jesus Christ is not the only author of forgiveness. He is so important in forgiveness that he is also the channel for it. He is the channel for it. Jesus is author and the channel. Truly author and finisher of our faith, right? That is Jesus Christ. Amen. He makes up everything in forgiveness. I mean, it just makes sense. Why? Because he was the one who died on the cross. See that? It wasn't the Holy Spirit who died on the cross. It wasn't God the Father who died on the cross. Jesus, the Son, died on that cross. He was the one who took all the penalty of sin, who did all the work, and then instigated and then did the whole works. That's why he is the completeness of our forgiveness, and he is very important for us to understand, wow, I need to realize how important Jesus Christ is. So when you see other religions degrading or minimizing Jesus' role, deity, salvation, anything, making him secondary, because that's what they like to do. They try to put the Father first, Jesus secondary. But no, we believe they're one and the same God. So don't make him like a secondary role because he is your primary role for forgiveness if you're going to think about it. If you don't believe me, then God believes me. Because God says, I cannot forgive you if it weren't for that channel, Jesus. So go to Acts 13, 38. Acts 13, 38. Be known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, see, Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. So notice right here, it's through this man. And that's why we're able to preach about it. God declares the gospel, has them all to get saved through this man. 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. So, light bulb moment for a lot of lost people who don't get this. Then why do you pray to saints? Why do you pray to Mary? Why do you bow to images? Why do you think that by kissing an image or touching some lucky charm... Kissing a, uh, and if Muslims are laughing and saying amen to that, why are you kissing a black stone? Right. Okay? Yeah. Why are you bowing down to some black box over there, a kaaba? And why are people going to humans, priests, for confession? Right. And even saved Christians, they feel like they're not really forgiven because 
uh, the, they did not go through the pastor to receive forgiveness. They feel, they feel like they get forgiven when the pastor tells them they're forgiven. That's not how it works. There's only one mediator. See that? That channel, right? Remember the gap? You and God. That's the whole bottom line to forgiveness. That's the whole issue, the reason. Okay, It's not to make you feel good. That's just a benefit or a bonus that comes out of it. It's because of that issue. Sin separates me from God. I need that to come together. That's why forgiveness is important. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one, notice, mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now let's go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. The next section is the foundation of forgiveness. The foundation of forgiveness. <clears throat> we covered the definition. We covered the problem. We covered the author. And now, fourthly, we're covering the foundation. Forgiveness doesn't just come out like that. God can't just say, I forgive you. He has to have certain foundations. In other words, prerequisites, okay? When you take a course in college, you can't just take that course unless if they say they have a foundational course or a prerequisite. In other words, you have to do this first in order to take that other college course. So see, you can't just come to forgiveness like that. God is ready to forgive, but you can't just come to him like that. There has to be a prerequisite or a foundation in place. So you want to know about this definitely. Psalm 78, verse 38. The Bible says in verse 38, but he being full of what? Compassion. Compassion forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. See, what makes God forgive you is because he is compassionate. Compassionate means even though you've done wrong against him, he has pity on you. He cares about you. So if you have trouble thinking that God forgave you, then you did not think about this foundation. You think God is not compassionate. So see, I told you this basic thing is a lot deeper than you think. Now go to 1 John 1. 1 John 1. Here's a second foundation. <clears throat> second foundation. 1 John chapter 1. Now this will be incredibly helpful for you if you're having a hard time thinking that you've been forgiven by God. The number one thing why we think we're not forgiven by God is because we know he's holy. And then you abused uh, his forgiveness so many times. So because of that, that's the reason why you think that I don't think God really forgave me. Maybe he forgave me, but not really. So that might be in your mind. But if you were to think about this, forgiveness is bestowed not just on the ground of the Lord's compassion, but on the ground of divine justice. So go to verse 9. The Bible says, <clears throat> If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you see that? He is just. See that? That means His holiness is not compromise. Well, how can God forgive me for this? Because I've just messed up so many times. Rest assured, he's not going to compromise his justice or his holiness. So when he forgives you, he really means it. I think God knows what he's doing more than you do. See, remember, we believe God is 100% in his attribute. So when he says he's just, he's holy, you think he's going to drop that percentage just a bit to forgive you? Absolutely not. He'll retain it 100% and remain wholly just God. That's why he can forgive you. Now, we're going to look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And how encouraging, amen? If we would only understand this doctrine, so-called basic doctrines are not basic. They're more deep than you think. And even if they are basic, a lot of times we need to go back to the basics. We need to be basic ourselves. Not just constantly deep, deep. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the third thing, forgiveness is bestowed on the ground of the blood of Christ. That's why you can receive forgiveness as well. Look at verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. See that? 
The blood is uh, explained, right? it's more specified here, he grants the forgiveness according to the riches of his grace. So, man, this is so genius. God's just not going to say, hey, I just want to die on the cross just because. He did it for a reason, because of the prerequisite, the foundation. I have compassion on that sinner. But number two, I can't just be compassionate and let them to heaven. I'm just. I have to not compromise my holiness. That led to the third prerequisite, the foundation. The best solution is for me to shed my blood. That way I can satisfy my justice, my wrath. I can satisfy that. And when you look at the cross, all you have to do is look at it. And movies nowadays, they don't even depict it as accurately. What if you were to see it in real life? That is God's justice fulfilled. So any wrong that you've done that God might see in you that he can't forgive, he just applies that to the cross and see that his wrath was already satisfied there. So he doesn't have to, that, he doesn't have to apply that to you now. Ain't that something? All right, so why can God do that? Well, Romans 6.23, we got to go back to the problem. <laughs> go back to the problem. What's the problem? Do you remember, church? What's the problem to forgiveness? Sin. Okay, if sin is paid for, if, sin is satis if the penalty for sin is satisfied, then uh, can't God forgive? See, it's that simple. <laughs> Our God is such a genius. Romans uh, 6.23 for the wages of sin is what? Okay. So see that? The problem is solved. Problem is sin. He can't receive forgiveness. The payment for it. Okay. You want sin to be paid for, it's death. That's the penalty. Okay. Who took that penalty? Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ took the penalty, which was death, in our behalf, so if the cross is the thing that made the ultimate difference for you and I, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, then uh, that's been applied. And guess what? Then this has been applied. That's why we see right here, then if covered under the blood, and remember, forgiveness means covering, and if it's not only covered, but cleared by the blood, Amen. so, then, look at this, if a person were to call upon God, pray to him, that's no sin there. Now, this should be something basic, but when it's drawn out, when it's more specified, when we look at it slowly and more deeply, then we realize, how could I not see that before? So then why are you suffering guilt still? All right, now uh, we're going to look at Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. The next section is the completion of forgiveness. The completion of forgiveness. Now, like I mentioned before, we might think that God forgives us, but we're wondering, did he really forgive me? That's what's eating us up. But when God forgives you, remember, we, he cannot disgrace his perfect attribute. If he's perfect in attribute, that means 100%. So if he says, I forgive you, that means 100%, I forgive you. So Luke chapter 7, verse 47. This is great. This is very, very encouraging. So how complete is his forgiveness? Where as often or as frequent as you sin, he can still forgive you. That's how complete it is. The Bible says in Luke 7, 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But look at this, this is encouraging. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. What does that mean? So it points out something very helpful and encouraging to you. Notice that the little forgiveness is looked down upon. So God does not want to do like a halfway forgiveness or even a, a little his forgiveness in any way, not even 1%. He looks down upon that. He believes in complete forgiveness 
no matter how many they are. Okay, uh, the next one for a completion of forgiveness, let's look at Psalm 103 and Colossians 2. Psalm 103 and then uh, Colossians chapter 2. What I like about this chart that I'm going to show to you is the simplicity of understanding how complete forgiveness is. So when you receive Jesus Christ by faith, see, remember, that cross is what covered it. It's what cleared the sin. Then all the world's sins were already placed on him and placed on that cross. So if we were to just have faith on what he did, then we get Christ's righteousness, and that is placed upon us. Ain't that something? That's how complete the forgiveness is, is zero sin, but also righteousness. That's why he can forgive you. Now, he can't even spare one sin, not even one. He must forgive all. There's no such thing as committing the unpardonable sin for people today. When people say you committed the unpardonable sin, well, they didn't read that passage. If they were to read that passage, that's simply blaspheming Jesus Christ in person. And that could have been only committed before the cross, because after the cross, he granted complete forgiveness. And that can only be committed in the millennial kingdom when he's ruling physically on the earth. So there is no such thing as an unpardonable sin to a saved believer. It's all pardon. So there's no fear on that one. Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgiveth, what? All thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Look at chapter 32. Chapter 32. I trust your hand is still at Colossians 2. We're going to go there. But go to Psalm 32. And then notice at verse 1. God cannot spare one. Just as much as he cannot spare one soul... One sinner into his heaven, he must make sure all must be damned for their sin. It's likewise for salvation in heaven. He can't even spare one where they're going to end up in hell. He's going to make sure that all go to heaven if they go, went through that access of forgiveness. Psalm 32 and verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. We saw that. But now look at verse 2. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is what? No guile. That means that when God forgives you, there should be none. We look at Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. And then verse 13. Colossians 2, and we will look at verse 13. And by the way, it's either this passage or the one in Ephesians chapter 1 that the modern Bible versions took out. They took out one of the most important things that you should know about. All right, let's look at Colossians chapter 2 and uh, verse 13. But anyway, uh, actually, I, was, I meant uh, Colossians chapter 1 for the verse that the modern Bible versions took out. It's either that one or Ephesians 1. But it was in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So the blood has been deleted either in Colossians 1.14 or in Ephesians 1.7. But uh, besides that, Colossians 2.13, it's a different verse, I apologize. The Bible says, now look at this, Very, uh, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you what? So God made sure to specify that, all trespasses. We're going to look at Ephesians 1 again, okay? And then 1 John 2, 1 John 2. Ephesians 1 again, and then we're going to look at 1 John chapter 2. Now, why do I believe once saved, always saved? Because remember, the basis, the key where I am able to have salvation and all of justification, adoption, sanctification, etc., etc., is because of forgiveness, right? Now, forgiveness is not just a past tense. So it's not just because as a repentant sinner, I believed on Christ for my salvation in the past, 
And then if I slip up sometime in the future that, oh, I have to do it again. When I did that in the past, it became a present tense that has carried on even to today in spite of me sinning. So if I commit many sins, remember God says that he can't even spare one, they're all forgiven. In the present tense, not just, hey, I forgive you at the past. That's why I believe in eternal security. So when we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we had redemption through his blood or have? Present tense. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Present tense. Uh, look at 1 John 2, 12. 2, 12. Forgiveness is a present possession. 1 John 2, 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins, what? Are forgiven you for his name's sake. Because of Jesus Christ. Why? He is the author, the channel, the one that makes up and completes your forgiveness. Okay, let's look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Now, think about this. Like I given that analogy before, God can't spare one sin. He has to make sure that even if it's just one, it's enough to put you out of heaven, correct? If that's the case, if he's going to let you inside heaven, he has to give complete forgiveness. Otherwise, he can't let you into heaven because he can't spare one. That means he has to, whether he likes it or not, but he does like to because he's compassionate, he has to give you 100% forgiveness. So Revelation 21, verse 27. Notice right here how God is very strict on sin. And there shall in no wise enter into it. Okay, that means no compromise. Anything. That means literally anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5. Now let's talk about the conditions of forgiveness. The conditions of forgiveness. Okay, if you want to get forgiveness of sins, then you need to do this for your salvation. You need to do this for your salvation. And by the way, this is very interesting. It's not just salvation, but even practical living, practical everyday living, you can do this as well. So let's look at Acts chapter 5 and verse 31. So if you want to receive forgiveness, then you need to do these three following steps. Now, I think the reason why people are having trouble believing in this doctrine of forgiveness is that it's such a license to sin. That's how they see it as. So in other words, uh, I can commit murder, do whatever I want while receiving present tense forgiveness. Well, you have to understand this. That's not how it works. So when you get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to receive forgiveness, there's got to be obviously a conviction of sin over there. There's got to be a repentance. Now, I'm not saying that you have to stop sinning because God knows that's impossible. And by the way, how can he... Uh, how can he keep forgiving you, eternally secure you, if he didn't know you're going to sin in the future? <laughs> so it's just obvious that you and I are going to sin. However, that doesn't mean that God is saying, hey, you know, just ask me for forgiveness while having it in your heart. I just want to do whatever I want to do. So God doesn't do that. That's not how forgiveness works. That's how it shouldn't work for common sense. If you want to receive forgiveness from somebody, there's obviously a common sense there that there is a repentant heart. So that's why people are having trouble understanding that. So no, we don't say that you have no guilt whatsoever, no conviction. There's got to be repentance there. So in Acts chapter 5, verse 31, the Bible says, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give what? Repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So see, repentance is necessary for forgiveness. We don't deny that. Now look at Luke chapter 7. <clears throat> Luke chapter 7. Now the mistake that everybody does, and unfortunately Lordship Salvation teaches this way, is that, <clears throat> and by the way, Catholics do and other religions, 
is they think salvation to receive forgiveness of sins is by that repentance and by not doing those sinful actions again and living well for the Lord. Good works. No, that's not how it works. When there's a conviction and a repentance there, your works are not required for your salvation because God knows that your work is still going to mess up. No matter how strong your repentance is, your work is still going to mess up. So God, understanding that, when he takes your repentance, he does the work for you. So when you look at this, the idea is this, is that when you sin, you sin against Christ, and Christ took your sin. So when there's that, here's the idea, okay? So with this sin, if you have that repentance, uh, let me write up here, that way people can see it more clearly. With that repentance there, then what happens, let me erase all of this, that way we can see more clearly. I am sorry for my sin, I'm guilty, whatever. The point is, when there's a repentance over the sinful condition, this is the area that people mess up in. They know that their sins were put upon Christ, Christ died for them, but they don't know what that really means. What that really means is he should be doing all the work there. So in this point right here, the work of your sin, see that? The work over your sin is Jesus Christ. The cross. The cross does all the work for you. Once the cross works all your sins for you, then what happens is, then you don't have to do any work whatsoever. But you need to receive that cross, right? You need to believe it. You need to rely on it. You need to put your trust in it. That's what faith is. See that? Faith is the key for you to receive the forgiveness of sins. And that's why we quite often say that uh, faith doesn't go without repentance and repentance doesn't go without faith for salvation. Those are essential prerequisites and ingredients that make sense about our salvation. People nowadays, they're just saying, oh, I believe, I believe, but there is no conviction over their sin. They don't even realize the sinful problem exists. They just see a smiling preacher named Joel Osteen and then telling them about how wonderful your relationship with Jesus Christ is and you want to receive the cross to have a happier life. That's a false notion. We receive the cross of Christ. We put our trust in it because of that problem first, sin. So then that repentance is so crucial where we recognize the problem, but at the same time, it's not lordship salvation where you're doing any work whatsoever. When there's that repentance there, all you can do now is put your trust on that cross to do the work for you. Comprende? Does that make any sense? <clears throat> so, we realize the importance of this uh, doctrine to receive the condition of forgiveness. Luke chapter 7 and Verse 47, verse 47. Notice, wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins, uh, he says right here, thy sins be, uh, are forgiven. Verse 50, and he said to the woman, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. Now, isn't that eye-opening? The eye-opening thing here is that this is before Jesus died on the cross to give salvation by faith. But God even knew that outside of salvation in Jesus Christ, so you can see right here, it can apply to everyday living. So in everyday living, that's outside of your salvation. Let's talk about your walk in Jesus Christ, for example. That if you sin against God, even if they are many, that faith is important. Putting your trust in the cross of Christ is important for you to receive forgiveness. That's why you feel like you're not forgiven. You don't trust in the work of the cross. That's why you don't feel like that. But that trust and that faith is necessary. If you're able to do that with your salvation, I don't know why you can't do that with your walk. 
All right, now let's look at uh, 1 John 1 and Galatians 6. 1 John 1 and Galatians chapter 6. The last one is confession. Confession is necessary. You have to obviously tell the Lord, uh, God, I am sorry for this wrong thing that I have done. Will you please forgive me for it? Obviously, when you're receiving forgiveness, you're acknowledging the fault. So you have to acknowledge that. You have to say that to him. God wants to hear it out of your mouth. Obviously, how am I going to forgive you if you don't confess it to me? See, so you got to confess it to me. That's why forgiveness is more operable that way. When you look at 1 John chapter 1 and then verse 9, the Bible says, If we confess our sins, see that? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we look at Galatians chapter 6 and then verse 7, what we understand is that a saved Christian has his sins completely forgiven from punishment in the case of his soul. But nevertheless, a saved Christian must have his sins forgiven from punishment, even though his soul saved, his body's not. So due to the punishment of the body, death of the body, because we looked at that, right? The penalty for sin is death. But we see in the case of the soul, that's hell. Well, what about your body? That's why daily confession is important. Not related to salvation, but to basically your everyday living we're talking about, your everyday life. Your body we're talking about, not your soul. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap what? Corruption. See that? To your flesh. So that's why your body's getting punished because uh, you're not confessing that to the Lord. Now, the frequency of forgiveness. Let's go to the... Uh, Forget that. We'll go to the frequency of forgiveness. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1 again. And then I want you to go to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Let's talk about the frequency of forgiveness. The frequency of forgiveness. Now, you might think that we talked about the frequency. But no, we talked about the completion. Frequency and completion, they a lot of times go hand in hand. But they are still very different. Completion is that it's thoroughly done, not one sin spared. It is uh, completely covered. Frequency is as many times it happens. Sometimes frequency can be inside completion, but we still have to distinguish the two. That way we can assure ourselves that we are forgiven. Not just thoroughly, but often, as many times. How frequent? As long as you repent and confess. That's important. As long as you repent and confess. Now, a lot of times we feel like that we're not forgiven because we didn't really repent when we confess, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, did I really mean it when I confess that sin? So that's the reason why uh, we go through guilt problems. So when we talk about repent and confess... One thing you have to understand is, one, in 1 John 1, 9, notice right here, he's still just, right? And whenever you confess, he assures that he'll cleanse everything, correct? And when he says that, that goes alongside repentance, not just confession alone. He applies that to repentance too. That's why it's so important those two go together. I don't like it when people separate the two. When you separate the two, you get rid of a wonderful promise. Because people are going through a guilt trip. Did I really get forgiven when I confess it? Because I didn't really repent. But that often frequency applies to repentance too when you look at Luke 17. Now, this is the verse that I use quite often. More than 1 John 1, believe it or not. <laughs> Would you believe that? This is the verse that I use more often than 1 John 1. Notice what Jesus Christ tells a fellow believer to do. So if a fellow believer does this, God would do it more so. Luke 17, verse 4. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day. See that? Not just frequently, but seven times in that one day. And seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent. 
you and I would probably go, no, you don't really mean it. <laughs> but God says what? Thou shalt forgive him. Okay, did that encourage you a bit? So believe it or not, I use this more often than 1 John 1, and I don't like it when people separate repentance and confession. That does disgrace to God forgiving because people think they can do whatever they want. And then the second thing is that it gets rid of a wonderful promise because we wonder if we really did repent. When you get saved for your salvation as a repentant sinner, it's easier than you think, see? Now, uh, Christians are to always forgive as much as God. That's the hard part, okay? As much as God. So that's Ephesians 4.32. For time's sake, we won't turn there. Ephesians 4.32. But that verse has been quite often used concerning bitterness and other things that Christians struggle to forgive. The only way you can forgive is through Christ. Remember, isn't that the basis? If that's the basis, you got to stop looking at your feelings, your hurt, or that person's sin. You have to only look through Jesus Christ. And when you see how much Jesus Christ forgave you, okay, if you have a hard time forgiving that person because of the wrong they did to you, look at Jesus Christ getting his beard plucked out, getting whipped, and those nails on his hand. And say the wrongdoing that that person did against you was placed on Jesus Christ. And, he, and that was brutally punished enough. Don't you think the punishment is good enough? So why not? Grant forgiveness. But it's not just that. It's more so of you when you look at Jesus Christ, not the other person's sin. It's more so of you when Jesus Christ went through that. And when you see how much Jesus Christ was punished for you, don't you think he's punished enough that you should receive forgiveness? And then when you think about that, as much as God forgave you, as much as he was penalized for you, beaten for you, it's easier to forgive the person and then lower the bitterness. Now, the third thing is uh, just because your sins are always forgiven does not mean you will always escape punishment. That's important. Not escaping punishment. So sometimes there are two extremes. One, people think that as long as they confess it under the blood, then they're not going to reap what they sow. No, I, I don't care uh, what you say. You can be forgiven by God, but one day you're going to pay the price one day. You can, if you smoke so many times for many years, even though you get forgiveness by God and it's all covered under the blood, the lung can't forgive you. It took its toll and it's going to kill you. Right. See, so not all the time will you escape punishment. There are two verses I want to show you and turn to, and then we'll call it a day, okay? Two verses that I want to show you. This is probably going to be the most helpful part in this lesson, maybe. The most helpful part. So I have to turn to these verses. Because quite often, you and I, when we get forgiveness by God, we do know the reaping and sowing, the payday's coming, right? So that's what scares us. That's what bothers us. So I think this might help you with your direction. So this might give you a little bit more direction on what to do when... You're going through the consequences of sin and you're forgiven, but you're still going through the pain. So this might help you, okay? And I'm pretty sure most of us are going through this. <laughs> 1 Samuel 12, verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 12, uh, 2 Samuel, I'm sorry. Ugh, why did I say 1 2 Samuel 12? Think about David's case. When God said he forgave him for his sin of uh, murder and adultery, God forgave him, correct? However, that did not mean that he went without punishment. He took the life of his baby, took his baby home to heaven. Why? Because the sin was so great. Two keys how you could escape punishment and how you don't escape punishment. You ready? Two keys. And I have a sermon on this. You can uh, listen to the sermon too if you want, okay? It's called Cry of the Punished. Cry of the Punished. Sincerity and situation. Sincerity and situation. These are the two crucial factors God keeps looking at. And he'll, determining the situation, how it looks, he'll say, okay, I won't let the punishment happen. And depending on your sincerity, then he'll say, I won't let the punishment happen. 
So that's why I confessed it all the stinking time. I'd really try to make up for it. I try to really be sincere as I can for the Lord. So in this case, it's not just that I simply repent and receive forgiveness. I want to really prove that out. I want to prove how sincere I am. So that's where I believe that you're going to have to prove your sincerity there. You're going to have to do some work, some effort. Your conviction's got to be genuine and proven there. So in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, Nathan said, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, look at this, situation. Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now look at this, verse 16, David did not stop repenting, confessing. Why? Because he thinks that God could change the punishment. He knew that. That's why he had to prove his sincerity in spite of how bad the situation looked. So uh, look at verse 22. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? Okay, now go to Jonah 3. Jonah 3. Now this is Old Testament. Old Testament, God is severe in his law. But look how gracious he is. Jonah even knew that. <laughs> look at Jonah chapter 3, verse 8. Jonah chapter 3, verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. See that? They're trying to prove their sincerity. Not just saying, I'm sorry, but crying mightily. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hand. Notice right here, lordship salvation, so to speak. They're stopping their sin. And notice that the Bible says in verse 10, that's a work. God saw their works. Ain't that enlightening? <laughs> okay. So that's why I don't believe in lordship salvation. Okay. But anyway, uh, it is a work. Okay. But anyway, verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? That's why they had to really prove their sincerity. And then notice right here in verse 10, God repented of the evil that he did to them. Why? Because in their situation, he can do that. And in time anyway, Nineveh, he knew that Nineveh would mess up in sin. So his judgment and destruction came at a later time. It was just postponed. But in David's case, he couldn't do it that way. It's an individual. So in David's case, because he just ruined his testimony in front of his enemies, and they saw that, those enemies need to see that God don't let him get away with that. See, so you have to realize sincerity and situation is key. So if you want to change God's mind about his punishment, you have to make up for that situation. And you have to prove your sincerity. So you got to look at it the way God looks at it. And you might be surprised how many things you can get away with. Okay? All right, God, my Father, I pray that today's teaching has been extremely helpful about the lesson on forgiveness. Opened our eyes to appreciate more on what you did for us. Uh, bless the break time, the fellowship, and the next service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.